You may have noticed, um, if you've been trying to talk, that we have muted all of the phone lines except for those for the speakers today. And that is because we do have a lot of folks on the webinar, um, and we want to make sure that we can hear from our speakers as much as possible. So you will not be able to ask questions through the phone. But there is a chat box function through the webinar itself. Some of you have already used that. If you look over towards the right of your, your screen, you'll see this little bubble that looks like a dialog box, like a cartoon dialog box. If you click on that, you can submit questions um, to Q&A to the group throughout the webinar. Whenever they come up, you can type those in there. And we'll be collecting all of those questions. And then at the end of the webinar, the last few minutes, we'll answer as many of those questions as possible. Any questions that we are not able to answer today during the call itself will be compiled, and the speakers um, or other folks um, at the National Veterans Technical Assistance Center will answer those questions, and all of those answers will be posted on um, the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans website early next week, along with a recording of the entire webinar and the PowerPoint slides as well. So with that, um, as I mentioned, there will be um, a post-webinar survey that will come out later today. Please look for that um, in your regular email, but also for some of you who have higher spam filters, please look for that in your junk box as well. It will give us a chance to see how we're doing and also to um, make sure that any, address, any questions or issues that aren't addressed that we'll be able to cover those in the future. Um, I have the great pleasure now of introducing our first speaker. And our first speaker is Dr. Nancy, Nancy Glowacki, and she is the Women Veteran Program Manager with the U.S. Department of Labor Veterans Employment and Training Service, also known as DOL Vets. Um, prior to coming to Vets, she served as a subject matter expert on veterans' transition issues for the military, the Department of Veteran Affairs, and as an independent consultant. Her education includes a Doctorate of Management and Organizational Leadership, a Master's of Business Administration and Human Resource Management, and a Bachelor of Science. So we're thrilled to have Dr. Gulaki with us today. Nancy, you can go ahead and start. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really thrilled to be on this webinar today, and I thank you uh, particularly for your patience while we had a little bit of a glitch there starting out. I'm really thrilled to see so many people with an interest in today's topic, and I hope that you will take advantage of the opportunity that Cindy talked about to submit questions. I know that I am really looking forward to reviewing those, um, which will also help me as we move forward with the Women Veteran Program to know uh, what questions are, are being raised by people like yourself. So anyhow, as Cindy said, my name is Nancy Glowacki. I'm an Army veteran, and I've been in this field of veterans employment for about 10 years since I got out of the military myself due to service-connected injuries. Uh, I currently have the pleasure of serving as the Women Veteran Program Manager at DOL Vets, and we have just crossed our two-year mark uh, around the August-September time frame. So I'm very proud of where we've been with this program and of where we're going. Uh, Cindy, could you go ahead and advance to slide two, please? Yes. So on this slide, you'll see a somewhat formal description and a pretty broad overview of what the Women Veteran Program actually does. In a nutshell, my time is spent either on analysis or engagement. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot um, that we don't yet know, and there has also been there have also been a lot of myths and stigmas out there, and so a lot of time is kind of spent fact checking. Um, and of course, engagement so that we can make sure that complementary service providers know about the important employment services that we do here at DOL Vets so that we can make those referrals back and forth. Um, and we've got some really powerful relationships with interagency partners um, and nonprofit groups as well. We're currently the only ones in the veteran space doing the specific type of fact checking. Uh, which has positioned vets as an advisor on the employment situation of women veterans. So we do um, get a lot of calls uh, to speak, to sometimes answer questions, and we always welcome those. And you'll see my contact information on the last slide, too, so you're welcome to contact me as well. Uh, let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. 
And on this slide, you can see some examples of the type of analysis that we do. Um, I routinely review existing and new literature pertaining to women veterans for potential relevancy to employment services. And I've now looked at 19 years of unemployment data comparing the four groups, women veterans, women non-veterans, male veterans, and male non-veterans. And next week, I'll be looking at the 2015 annual averages, and that will make 20 years of data. Uh, when we began that review, uh, when our program was brand new, I actually was digging that far back, um, well, for one reason, because that was as far as I could go and see consistent variables in the data. But I was looking for long-term trends that would be very specific and very clear pertaining to vet trends or to women or to both. And what I actually found was a little surprising, uh, and it, I think we were very lucky we found it that early on because it told us to dig deeper beyond those big titles. Uh, what I found is that without exception in those 19 years, the highest unemployment rates according to annual averages either were for women veterans or male non-veterans. And so then we really had to look deeper. What else do those two populations have in common? Well, they're more likely than the other two to be in the labor force at all. So for the 2013 and 2014 data, um, really started looking far more in-depth at ages, um, at different, uh, the diversity between the different populations, you name it. And like I said, in 2015, um, annual averages will be released tomorrow, and I'll be uh, doing a far more in-depth analysis of that next week, and I'm actually really looking forward to that. I've also had the pleasure of engaging directly with some folks like yourselves, um, other service providers, employers, women veterans themselves, from different geographical areas uh, to hear the real world, what's happening, what has helped you, what has not helped you. Um, and that's always been um, uh, very powerful there too. The collective findings have been the driving force of the current state of our women veteran program. And if you go to the DOL Vets page and click on Women Veterans, you'll see two downloadable handouts. You'll actually see four, um, but two of them are, are global for VETS programs or DOL programs. Two are specific to women veterans. Um, one is kind of just a fact sheet uh, with some explanations to commonly asked questions pertaining to the unemployment rates, et cetera, and I'll be talking about that today as well. That handout is just one page. We hope you'll download it, share it as you see fit. Um, the other one, share it as you see fit as well. It may not be quite as um, in demand for all audiences, but we find it really helpful to researchers. Um, and that is our handout on common challenges and existing gaps in research uh, pertaining to women veterans. As I said earlier, I've been in this field now for about 10 years, just over 10 years, and I've seen the same research questions asked again and again uh, with just different populations. And very often we're not asking the right questions or maybe we're asking a question that's already been asked and answered. Um, so we just put those, that out there. Um, anybody who has research capabilities or interest, we hope that they'll take advantage of that. If we could go ahead and go on to the next slide, please. What I'd like to do today is cover some answers to some frequently asked questions. Um, and those answers will also include a couple of updates that you may have heard about and may even be wondering about pertaining to the Women Veteran Program. So I'll be talking about our findings pertaining to employment service needs, self-identification as veterans, unemployment rates, um, and what we can do as service providers. And of course, those updates include a new Employment Assistance for Women Veterans webinar, and a policy update regarding the definition of homelessness. So going on to the next slide, our first frequently asked question, what employment services do women veterans need? Can we go on to the next slide, please? Thank you. So this question is often even more specific when it's asked to me, as in, what are the unique needs of women veterans? And what we found is not only is there really no answer to that question, but it can actually be quite offensive to 
uh, to some women. I've had some women that have just said flat out, look, when you ask a man about his experience, you ask him about his leadership skills or, or these other questions. And when you ask me, you ask about my unique challenges. Why is that? Um, and, and what we found is really that there's no unique challenges in the sense that they are exclusive to women veterans and that no two women veterans have identical experiences or needs. And it's really important to serve the whole person, which includes some veteran issues shared by our male veteran peers, some working women issues shared by our non-veteran sisters, and some general issues that are not exclusive to veterans or to women. And the most effective employment services are delivered equally to both genders, and they're effective because they're customized for the individual person. So, we actually know now that the women veterans that have been served through the Jobs for Veterans State Grants Program, for example, and this was um, found in a recent Chief Evaluation Office study here at Department of Labor, uh, it found that these veterans, these women veterans, actually experienced higher entered employment rates and higher wages and lower wage gap than their non-veteran female peers that were served through comparable programs. And I think that is a real testament to the work um, of the people on this call and everybody in our field, and that the individualized intensive employment services really do work, um, and they really do serve women veterans. Wage gap, as you may know, is a real problem for many women, and so to see that lowered for women veterans receiving our services is something that we're really, really thrilled about. Now, the biggest problem that I have seen and the one that concerns me the most pertaining to women veterans and employment is simply a lack of awareness about the free employment services available to them. So we've recently posted on our web page the Employment Assistance for Women Veterans webinar. And we have this in two formats. One is a simple YouTube video, uh, which is smartphone friendly, that we're hoping will increase um, the usability of the webinar. However, there is a lot of um, a lot of text because we wanted to be real clear with who qualifies for which services and have links to the actual regulations for people that like to have all the details and for service providers that need to have all the details to help their clientele. So we also have it available in a downloadable um, PowerPoint presentation that has audio and, and, and all, the, um, uh, all the extras um, that people can click on the links. They can use some of the slides or all of the slides in their own presentations as they see fit. So if you could please help us get the word out about that, we would greatly appreciate that. Now, if we could go on to the next slide. Um, the next most frequently question that I hear is, why don't they just tell people they are veterans? And you may have heard um, that women are less likely than men to self-identify as veterans or to disclose their veteran status, um, enter the terminology that you've heard here. And while this is largely anecdotal, it does appear to be true. So let's talk just a little bit about some reasons why, and more importantly, what we can do as service providers. So the first reason actually applies to men, too, and that is simply that the definition of veteran is confusing. Um, Department of Labor has a definition. Um, in fact, we have one for priority of service, and then we have another for JVSG programs. The VA has a definition. Um, it's, it's really confusing. And so we do find that simply asking, have you ever served in the military, instead of are you a veteran, yields a better response, a more reliable response. But looking at some reasons that are reported specifically by women, the first one is quite simple. I, we hear women say, well, I just didn't think about it. And frankly, I've been out of service for a little over 10 years now. If I didn't work in this particular career field, I, I don't believe I would still be talking about it on a daily basis. Um, women are just less likely than men to tie their identity to their profession, particularly a former impression, uh, former profession. So again, it's really important to simply ask every potential client, have you ever served in the military? Now, the next reason is the most disturbing, and so I want to, um, I want to move on to this one and spend a couple minutes on it, and that is um, that societal assumptions and things that people say 
even though they have no male intent, can actually cause some women to stop talking about it because they simply try to avoid these types of interactions. And if you take a look at the Stick That cartoon, that actually came to me via Facebook in my personal life um, because this is so common. I've yet to meet a woman veteran who has not been asked if she's the spouse of a veteran or the sister of a veteran or even the mother of a veteran, um, and it's really, really offensive. Um, this still happens. And so I ask myself a lot in my current role, how can this still be happening? And that's where we get into the great divide. Um, I do believe that this is largely due to uh, our impressions as human beings being formed based on our own experiences and what we're exposed to. So if you could go on to the next slide, I'd like to explain what I mean by the great divide and what it means specifically for women. So I'm sure that pretty much most of the people on this call will have heard of the great divide, or maybe you've heard it referred to as the civilian veteran divide. Um, but primarily it's simply this divide that causes veterans to feel disconnected from society that doesn't understand what veterans have been through. And so when I look at the actual data, for every 11 adults in this country, one is a veteran. So when we think of the Great Divide, that's one veteran being divided from 10 non-veterans. But if you go to the next slide, you can see what happens when we separate by gender. For men in this country, 17% are veterans. That's one in six. And then if we go on to the next slide, you can see the great divide for women, one in 56. So in order to be exposed to a male veteran, I will have been exposed to approximately six men. And yes, that is including those older male veterans, maybe our grandfathers, um, but I'm talking here about perceptions. When we think of a veteran, we still think of a man. And that's, that's quite natural. Whereas with women, I will have been exposed to women, of course, but the chances of me being exposed to a woman are not great, and since we tend to blend in, I probably have been exposed to women veterans and not even known that they were veterans. So this is really, the great divide is, is quite extreme for women, and I think that's really important for us as service pro providers to remember that it's critical that we are always asking that question, have you ever served in the military? Um, if you could go on to the next slide, please. Here you can see the, what I call the overlap of two minorities, and for a lot of people it's more than two minorities. That overlap there can be a pretty lonely place. I actually once had an employer call me, and keep in mind, if they call me, they're the good guys, um, and he asked me why he wasn't seeing more women service members, transitioning service members at the military job fairs he was going to. And I was surprised. I said, really, there's no women there? And he said, well, they are. There are women there. And then he got very quiet, and he said, oh, my gosh, I just assumed they were spouses. And even on a military base, because they were in civilian clothing, he thought they were there to support their male spouse. And he was going to one or two a week. And he, from that point forward, he just started asking each and every person, have you served in the military? And he called me a week later and said, I'm so embarrassed to say this, but it was me. It was, the, it was me not asking the question and making an assumption. They were there all the time. Um, so I think that's just so important. And the statistics on this slide just kind of point out that women are more likely than men to be in the civilian labor force. Um, and that is largely due to the older male generation aging out and um, more women entering and leaving the, the, the service. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, this may be the most frequently asked question of all, and that is, why are the unemployment rates higher for women veterans than for male veterans? And this is answered on um, the handout that I referred to earlier, uh, so I don't want to spend a great deal of time on this today. But in a nutshell, that question is basically like asking why apples don't look like oranges. They're, they're just not two comparable populations. Um, in fact, if you, if you, when you look at um, veterans overall, 48% of male veterans in 2014 were over 65 years old. Um, compared to 14% of women veterans being over 65 years old. So we're just not comparing 
to comparable populations with that question. And women veterans are more likely to be in the subpopulations that have higher unemployment rates, which includes veterans currently enrolled in school. And that is a data point that we only had for the first time last year. So I know I'm, like I said, I'm kind of excited. I'm a, I'm a data geek. I'm kind of excited about um, going through the 2015 data next week and seeing if we see this trend continued. Uh, I suspect that we will. So the key here is that as service providers, we don't forget the women, that we maybe put a little bit extra effort into making sure that they're not being overlooked. Um, if we go ahead and move on to the next slide. So the more comparable question, or where we can actually compare apples to apples, so to speak, is how do the unemployment rates of women veterans compare to women non-veterans? For the past two years, they have not been statistically different. And again, I'm, I'm anxious to see what's going to happen when the, the data drops tomorrow to see if this trend is continued. I, I suspect that it will be. Um, and this is good news, but it also means that as veteran service providers, we have got to look outside of our comfort zone of what we consider to be veteran issues, and we have got to look at what some may consider to be women's issues. And I would argue that today's generation, particularly with the millennials, they're not women's issues anymore. They apply to many men. Um, but, you know, some may consider them to be women's issues, and there certainly still remains a gender wage gap in this country. So as service providers, we've got to be looking at these things as well. And an example of this would be that women veterans are more likely than male veterans to experience poverty, but we know that that gender com comparison is also true of non-veterans. Um, and so we've got to really make a concerted effort to look at employment challenges of both the veteran population and the women population. Now, issues that disproportionately affect women can't be overlooked in the services, the resources, and the public policy designed to serve veterans. And sometimes that goes uh, or that comes from, you know, decision makers far above us. Uh, and one example of that is an oversight, which I believe it was an oversight, but a discrepancy in the definition of homelessness um, in two titles under the Code of Federal Regulations, and that is Title 38, which you all know pertains to veterans programs, and Title 42, which pertains to everyone. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, in 2009, President Obama signed the Homeless Emergency Assistance and Rapid Transition to Housing, or HEARTH Act of 2009, and that mandated that persons fleeing domestic violence and other life-threatening situations be considered homeless for the purpose of receiving public services, for example, HUD programs. Now, this change, which is not limited to women, but I believe does disproportionately impact women, did not make it into the definition of homelessness in Title 38, which impacts all veterans programs. And so this was not Department of Labor or DOL vets leaving it out. It was, it simply didn't make it into Title 38. And, um, you know, every opportunity that I have, I, I try to educate people on that so that the issue can get raised um, higher and higher. And I know that our leadership has raised it as well um, for the Title 38 issue. But for DOL vets, we have recently implemented policy that does include the same language as Title 42, particularly, uh, or excuse me, regarding persons fleeing domestic violence. And so this is not doing something special uh, for, for women veterans. This is simply getting on par with the definition that is used for programs outside of the veteran community. And so I, of course, am very, very happy about this policy change. And I want to be very clear that we are not asking service providers to become experts in domestic violence. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we know that women who receive intensive employment services, such as JVSG, such as HBRP, do much better than those who do not. And so with this policy change, we're simply making those same intensive employment services available to veterans who cannot escape a life-threatening situation without their own source of income. And um, I, I announced this recently at a um, women veteran conference. It was led by a nonprofit. 
and it was um, really overwhelming how many women came up to me afterwards, um, people you'd never expect that had personal experiences, and they said, you're absolutely right, you can't escape something like that without your own source of income. Um, so employment is just paramount. And I, I just really want to echo the point that what you all do is exactly what we need you to do. Um, it's those intensive employment services that are really going to make the difference here. And just like we always would do, we can make complimentary referrals to, uh, to meet any additional needs that, that she or he may have while we focus on employment. Um, now, I know that this is a new topic for vets, and some of us may even be a little bit uncomfortable with it. And that's one reason why um, I'm so happy that I'm going to be followed by Karen, who's going to talk to us about using trauma-informed care to meet clients where they are. And I want to uh, confess here that I, I used to be a little resistant to the term trauma-informed, and that goes back to what I said earlier about how our own perceptions and expectations are very largely based on what we've experienced and been exposed to as human beings. Now, in my current role, I've had um, the advantage of attending trauma-informed training. And I can tell you I was wrong to, to be resistant to it. It is so important. And what it really does, whether I ever like the title or not, <laughs> um, what it really does is help us all to meet all people where they are. And that's not specific to women veterans or to veterans, frankly, or even to women. Um, so I truly believe with your existing knowledge of providing employment services and what we're going to learn from Karen, there's just no need to be uncomfortable with the change in policy. Um, and again, this is new, and um, I am planning to um, to, to get some additional training together in the next year. So I hope that you will take advantage of answering those survey questions so that um, I can learn from them in what training is needed. And um, you're also welcome to contact me at any time to discuss. So, um, you know, keep my contact information, which will be on the last slide. So let's go on to um, the next slide, please. Uh, before I turn it over to Karen, I'd just like to quickly recap what we can do as service providers to help women veterans. And I hope that you'll pull this slide up again later and maybe even add to it. Let me know what you're adding to it. I'd love to hear your input. Uh, first, remember women in all of your outreach to veterans and remind your colleagues uh, or people in your network to remember veterans in their outreach to women. And I think that is forgotten quite a bit with us being actually less than 2% of women. Ask each and every client or potential client, have you ever served in the military? And recognize the service of any person who says yes equally. Uh, we cannot make assumptions, even assumptions regarding combat. Um, and, and we don't have time to get into that on that call, on this call. But I still get, um, I still hear some, some pretty, pretty sad stories from women veterans who um, have received some pretty offensive comments that their service was not the same, et cetera, and that simply isn't true. Whenever possible, show employers the value that veterans of both, bring, both genders bring to the workplace, and at all times, refuse to make assumptions or generalizations. And if you witness others doing so, please speak up and educate them. Uh, we have to serve the individual, not the stereotype. And if at any time you know, you'd like me to talk to somebody, just please reach out to me. Uh, if we can go on to my very last slide, uh, you can see my contact information again is at the bottom. And I hope that you will go to our dol.gov slash vets slide, click on women veterans, and you'll see uh, the handouts and webinars um, that I talked about earlier and that you can see on this slide. And so with that, I know I've went over my time, my apologies. Uh, I will hand it back over to Cindy and Karen. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, before we hand it over to Karen, I did want to just spend just a couple minutes um, specifically for our HBRP grantees and for the JVSG folks who are on the call to talk about um, how what this means sort of practically and the documentation side of things. Um, what I have here is, as, as Nancy mentioned, the definition, the, this latest VPL did, um, well, make the, change the definition so that it actually reflects what the original definition was for the Hearth Act by adding paragraph B. That addition has not yet been added to HBRP 
um, guidelines. It may be added in the SGA in the future or it may come out in the next version of the grant provisions. So paragraph B is not yet um, specific to HVRP. This particular change was specific to the JVSG program. For HVRP folks, what I did do is pull up the homelessness definition per the, the solicitation for grant applications from last year, and you can see um, the way that serving um, veterans fleeing domestic violence applies to HVRP until that paragraph B change is made is through the imminent risk portion of the definition. So as all of our HBRP folks know, um, per HBRP definition of homelessness, an individual is considered homeless for HBRP eligibility only. Let's be I want to be clear about that. If they will imminently lose their housing, and that imminent loss of housing, as you can see here on the slide, is within 14 days um, that they will either um, suffer an eviction within 14 days that their current residence is in a room or a hotel or motel, but they don't have the resources necessary to stay there for 14 days, or, and this is the piece we're talking here, credible evidence, including a credible oral statement from the individual or family indicating that they can't stay there um, for longer than 14 days. And so that piece of the definition is what um, would apply for now to those folks who are fleeing domestic violence, whether women veterans or male veterans. Um, I also pulled up from the special grant provisions, again, the definition of homelessness. Um, it actually, this is sort of that, um, in the special grant provisions definition, that last piece under here about the imminent loss, so again, the at risk of imminently losing your housing, an oral statement from an individual or family seeking homeless assistance that is found to be credible shall be considered credible evidence. So. Um, that would be that would make someone eligible for the HVRP program if they were fleeing domestic violence um, and there was a credible statement from them to that effect. Um, as far as documentation for the HVRP side of things, um, it does say in the special grant provisions, and I've listed this here for folks who may need it, that self-attestation is um, appropriate documentation for that imminent risk um, to, to document homelessness under that imminent risk provision. For the, HP, for the JVSG folks, um, for those of you, since the paragraph B does now apply, that definition is applicable, what I did pull up is how you would determine that, how you would determine a veteran um, was homeless under that piece um, of the eligibility requirements. And per the original JVSG refocusing guidelines, which is VPL 03-14, um, any, an eligible veteran or eligible spouse is determined to have an SBE if he or she attests to belonging to one of the criteria, um, to one of those categories. And those categories um, include homelessness, 18 to 24, you all know those six categories, but homelessness now does include fleeing domestic violence because that definition has been updated. So again, self-attestation um, is the way to document those. So I just wanted to get that clear. I know that I was sort of anticipating a, a question that may come up later. Um, with that, we are going to move on to our next speaker. Um, while she's speaking, I do encourage you to submit questions through the chat um, function of the webinar so that we can get those addressed. Um, we are really, really lucky today to have Karen Guthrie um, with us. Um, Karen is a licensed social worker, and she's the social work coordinator um, for the HCHV High Risk High Utilization Program at the VA Boston Healthcare System. She served in multiple leadership and direct care roles throughout her long and illustrious career in the VA. She's dedicated to serving homeless veterans and to diminishing the social injustice of homelessness. Over the past two years, she's worked to further understand the impact of trauma and its influence on creating and sustaining veteran homelessness. She continues to work toward building awareness, sensitivity, and system changes that diminish the negative outcomes of trauma in this population. So with that, I'd like to welcome Karen. Great. Thanks so much, Cindy. And thank you, Nancy, as well. So um, why don't we go ahead and move to the next slide, please, Cindy. One of the things that we're, you know, if we want to touch base on trauma-informed care and give you some basic concepts of what trauma-informed care means. But I guess I wanted to say before we get started, 
if, if you don't remember anything else, because I know it's so hard um, at you know, almost 3 o'clock in the afternoon for those who are on the East Coast and, and those on the West Coast, it's lunchtime. Um, you know, if you can remember that trauma and homelessness really plays havoc or can play havoc with one's sense of belonging um, in their place in the world. And if you add to that intimate partner violence, where you don't have those um, those most core connections that are positive and and build on your resilience, it, it is even uh, more of a challenge. Um, but as we're going to touch base throughout this uh, brief conversation we're going to have here this afternoon, that all human beings are resilient, and just because one has experienced these things does not mean that they are going to be um, you know that they are going to be thrown under the bus forever. So I appreciate every one of you out there working with women veterans, um, and especially uh, women veterans who are homeless. So what are women veterans who have experienced intimate partner violence teaching us? Next. I wanted to give, this is a very long um, sort of description, and it's rather intense. So not every um, homeless woman veteran who, ex who has experienced intimate partner violence is going to um, have all of the dynamics that Susan does, but I wanted to give um, her as an example for some of the things that a woman uh, who has experience, a woman veteran who's experienced um, domestic violence might uh, present with. So Susan's been homeless for seven years. She's had multiple losses. She, her mother and her sister died within two months of each other. Um, and soon after her de their deaths, she, her boyfriend assaulted her, and she left the apartment, the shared apartment that they had together. She started drinking and using drugs, um, which resulted in her, the loss of her job. She's been living on the street in sh and in shelters and in various transitional housing since that time. While being homeless, she's been physically, emotionally, and sexually abused by multiple strangers and intimate partners. She often leaves the shelter and returns a few days later with visible cuts and bruises. Next. Her bank account has been emptied out multiple times from, quote, friends that she has given her debit card and PIN number to. She reports a feeling, a sense of survivor guilt that she survived when others haven't, and she often tries to take care of others. She does not define her experiences as traumatic. Uh, she doesn't have a diagnosis of PTSD. She hasn't been assessed uh, for PTSD. Um, she rarely eats uh, meals. She often gives her money or uh, away to others that are homeless. Um, she's been ho she was housed uh, two years ago, but was evicted six months after she was housed. A lot of problems, including having other folks live in the apartment, not paying her rent, and almost dying due to overdoses. Next. So where would we begin? Um, again, you, your focus, many of the, the folks that are on the call, is on employment, which is great because we all need um, not just the money, but something that's meaningful in our lives. And you folks know know how to um, help folks and bring that to re that reality to them. Well, so how does trauma-informed care provide guidance? Next. But so first of all, and I know Nancy said the, the whole the whole term trauma informed care. It is kind of elusive and vague, and you know it could be almost we could we could call almost anything trauma informed. But the definition really um, that was given by Den and Kane and Cook is the perspective that acknowledges the pervasive influence and impact of trauma on an individual, their provider and the organization that's delivering the case management and other supportive services and certainly employment services. You know, one thing that we maybe don't always think about is that we are all affected at some level by trauma. You know, you watch the news, you have your own life experiences, and those things sort of shift and change our perspective about our safety in the world. So all of us as humans, you know, we really develop ways of managing the reality that bad things can happen and when those things, bad things are happening in our own home, it, it really shifts our sense of belonging and safety and trust. So how we formulate our beliefs around survival and suffering 
makes a difference in how we respond to others who, ha who have suffered in, or who are suffering or who are experiencing traumatic events. Some of these responses that we, um, you know, that we have build safety and trust, yet others unintentionally build a variety of defenses that can contribute to limiting recovery from trauma. Next. So um, theoretically, you know, one of the, the, the grounding principles that I, I see trauma-informed care built on is really a systems model of social ecological model, which really says that everything influences the other. So that's why I think you know it's so important to have this discussion today, in understanding ourselves and understanding how our the, the veterans that we're working with and how society, how we all influence um, each other in, in understanding trauma. Next. So really, trauma-informed care is grounded in some basic belief that the environment influences our emotions, our physical well-being, and our social well-being. I mean, I think that any of us can, you know, one certain days of the week we may be feeling great, things are, we feel positive, we feel joyful, we feel like, um, you know, we aren't at risk of, of this or that or the other thing, but then there are other days that, that things come into our lives that make us question our well-being and, and the environment around us influences. So part of what we're talking about today is how we can more positively influence trust and safety for women veterans. Next. So I looked up on the National Center for PTSD's website um, and, and the definition of intimate partner violence. And you can see here on the screen, we all of us have had individuals that we've worked with who have experienced, experienced multiple or at least one or two of these, physical violence, sexual violence, threats of physical or sexual abuse, psychological or emotional abuse, and stalking. Next. So to really look at the research on intimate partner violence and women veterans, we know that um, women veterans and active duty military personnel have a higher rate of interpersonal violence than non-veterans. And the, the VA, they looked at um, this, and they found that three out of three to seven of every ten women report having experienced intimate partner violence. So a range from 30 to 70 percent. We also know that active duty veterans, there is three in every ten, or about 36 percent, report one or more types of intimate partner violence during their service. Next. So again, we all we know that humans are extraordinarily resilient um, in the face of a variety of traumas. We also know that social support is a key factor for recovering from trauma. And we wanted to differentiate um, that trauma-informed care can include uh, include treatment for PTSD, but it's not is not necessarily about treatment for PTSD. It's about our interactions. In globally um, with folks who have experienced trauma or all individuals. Um, we also know that PTSD, if one does, uh, is not uh, identified as PTSD, that they, their traumatic experiences can still impact their functioning and their well-being. Next. So there are some common uh, reactions to trauma, uh, feelings of guilt and shame, aggressive behavior, and suicidal thoughts. And one of the things I wanted to point out about these, um, these you know, sort of three clusters of, of um, reactions is that many of these are really ways of pushing, sometimes pushing people back um, and, uh, dis and feeling disconnected. So how we approach these situations um, really makes a difference in whether or not the person can become more transparent and open about their experience. All of the, these related behaviors may be sometimes misunderstood and approached in ways that can escalate unintentionally escalate the problem, especially if we're increasing one's guilt and a sense of shame, and then they were, are going to push back um, with uh, avoiding um, any kind of um, emotion that's associated with it in a more uh, transparent way. Next. So enhancing our trauma lens really you know, I found in myself that it's so easy to make assumptions um, about a situation given individual behavior, especially if they're really pushing hard uh, um, on you about uh, their situation. 
So symptoms and adaptations really are a way to develop and survive these traumatic experiences. So being able to recognize adaptations as one doing their very best to cope with what has occurred versus them just trying to, um, you know, give you a hard time. I know I used to have a, a vocational rehab specialist that worked for me and a great, great guy, and, you know, he was a recovered a veteran who recovered from homelessness and a variety of other things. And he would say, you know, these guys or these gals just don't have an interest in getting employed. They're, you know, they're not showing up at the appointments, and they're, even though they say they want to be employed, I don't think they really want to be employed. But sometimes looking a little bit deeper at, at the adaptation that one has had and why that may be, um, why they're, they're using that strategy, and if they're saying they want to be employed, maybe they truly do, but there's something that's blocking their ability to move forward with the steps that they need to um, in order to do that. So not all trauma survivors have the same challenges. You know, some uh, it, it depends on the dynamics of what ha what happened to them, how it happened, when it happened, and their life before that and their life after that. Be aware of how individuals respond to the environment and how we respond to them. Interactions make a difference in the recovery from these experiences. Next. So rethinking the process. Um, it, it, you know, I think we all that go into helping professions we really have a, a really high sense of responsibility for helping the veteran change a situation that's problematic to them and causing them to not have um, meet the goals that they desire to meet. And so in that process, we may sometimes misunderstand or judge them undermining their sense of safety and trust, and especially their sense of control. So safety, trust, and control are core to recovery. And acknowledging the veteran as their own expert in their life experiences is sometimes difficult to do because we see, we see them going down a path that we're, we're fearful um, is going to lead to pain and suffering. And uh, so to be able to find a way to talk with them about this uh, in a non-judgmental but in more of an inquiring kind of way, you know, how this matches up with the goals that they have. So under, and also again, as we've said, understanding our life experiences and how that shapes our interactions. Next. So again, um, realizing, recognizing, and responding uh, are very important. So what is the prevalence of trauma among the population that you serve in your work? Um, how we recognize the effects of the trauma on an individual, and not just the individual, but the program that we're working in or the system that we're working in or even the systems of employment outside of our own um, and where we're trying to obtain employment for a woman veteran. So responding by putting this knowledge into practice. Next. So what is the mission? Um, what, what do we ha need to focus on if we are to become more trauma-informed care, and how can we really set this as part of our mission? Um, SAMHSA has a great uh, a great. Um, document called TIP 57, and some of the things that they list as, as being important in creating a trauma-informed care uh, practice is um, commitment to trying trauma-informed, to developing, creating a trauma-informed program, and creating infrastructure that in, initiates support and guide changes, involve the veterans, involve the women veterans in the, in the process of understanding what will work for them and what they feel will be most helpful. You develop a plan within your organization or your work group or even, you know, if it's just you and your own practice um, that really begins to, to become aware of trauma and how it may be um, influencing how a person reacts to life. Create collaboration between providers and veterans and consumers um, among community organizations and among VA organizations and among Department of Labor, so maybe working together and finding ways to, to have a discussion about this together. Um, another thing that I've started the last couple of years, and I think it, I'm still I'm still trying to determine whether it's helpful or not, but I believe it is, is to continue re, continually reassess the change that we're trying to make. You know, do a, a little simple plan, do, study, act. Um, spreadsheet that shows, okay, this is what I want to try to change in my work or in my work group or in my organization, 
and you know really hone in on one item at a time and see how that how your behavior and how your um, how those shifts are re, are are making a difference or maybe they're not making the difference that you hope that they would. Next. Next. So one of the things I want to make you aware of is um, there's a document that the National Center on Family Homelessness developed uh, called an organiza organizational self-assessment. And a couple last year, I worked um, with several other folks, and we made some adjustments to this organizational assessment to really have it be more focused on veterans. Um, so there, this is sort of the format. You, it has a variety of, of to headings and topics that really drill down to see, you know, if your organization or your work group or you yourself uh, are trauma informed, and not as uh, a shaming, blaming thing, but as a way to begin to build awareness. And we're happy. I'd be happy to share that um, assessment with anyone who's interested. Next. So again, really looking um, more at it from a strength-based uh, lens when working with trauma-informed care, we really want to increase individual self-efficacy. We want to identify what strengths they've used to survive um, and promote and reward engagement together because, as we know, a lot of times it, it, when one has had a traumatic experience and when one is homeless, it pushes one into isolation. So really. Um, trying to reward engagement and rebuild control through choice and empowerment. Uh, it's very sometimes this is very hard for me because I um, I just I just want to take control because I want to make it better. I want to fix it, but you know to really take a breath and ask questions in a way that will help us understand the veteran's perspective and uh, and, and not overpowering them but enabling them to move forward with their own empowerment. And foster skill building, mastery, and resilience, you know, really um, looking at the strengths one has and identifying those strengths and, and, and reinforcing and encouraging that, those strengths. And identify um, choices and options. Sometimes we just, you know, we, I know myself sometimes I don't feel like I have any options. So to be able to really bring that um, bigger perspective to identify options so one doesn't feel like they're just uh, really caught in a situation that, where there are no options. And support decision rate making rather than giving um, direction. So hard to do, but all uh, great, great goals to have. Next. Emotional safety um, is essential for any kind of recovery from trauma. So validating one's emotions rather than evaluating the facts um, some of us have been so trained in looking for the facts, identifying the problem, um, finding solutions to the problem. We really have to take a breath and step back and um, validate emotions and normalize traumatic experiences. Uh, it, it's so, I think, for so many experiences that human beings have that are traumatic, uh, there are common reactions to those. And based on our history and based on uh, our support and based on what happens both before and after, uh, these reactions, can, you can really talk about them and normalize them. Uh, so, you know, I have to ask myself, um, you know, if this happened to me, what would my reaction be? And not that I'm, you know, I'm, my reaction is going to be the same, but sometimes it will give me insight into what that individual may be experience, experiencing. Um, then to reflect what you're hearing, you know, a good, these are good couples counseling skills that, um, that, that some of you may have learned over the years to be able to, um, you know, you think that you heard the person, but you really don't know until you reflect that back to them and have them repeat it for you because, you know, nine times out of ten there's something that you've missed or you may have missed the, the core emphasis that they wanted you to understand can tolerate discomfort or disconnection and strong emotions from clients or, or veterans. It doesn't mean that one um, should tolerate abuse, that one should tolerate someone screaming in your face, that someone is, you should tolerate someone who's putting you at risk to um, be the recipient of violence. But it does mean that you 
these are difficult stories, these are difficult situations, and uh, giving the, the, the individual a little space to, to think it through out loud with you and to be able to, um, you know, be tolerate the discomfort that you may feel. And understand that safety, choice, and control are vital for healing from trauma. And again, these are the things that have, they have been robbed of. So to be able to begin to get those back is sometimes a, a difficult path, but a, a vital path. And again, part of that is seeing the veteran as their own expert, and there are so many ways that veterans are their own experts, um, and, and to really re reinforce that. Next. Next. So I wanted to, um, you know, just give some examples on changing your environment within your work, um, with your, in your area of work that might make a big difference in how a veteran, a woman veteran might feel in that setting. We, I have an example, one of the physicians in the VA out in California um, gave the example of developing a whole new um, outpatient office and they decided that to put the, um, the waiting room in such a way that uh, you, the, the women would be sitting on either side of the hallway and then they felt that, well, then uh, the, the, they can talk to each other because they'll be sitting across from each other, and then as they walk down to their appointments, they can say hi and greet each other. And the women hated it. They, you know, said, oh, I feel exposed. I feel like people are watching me. So they had to remodel what was, had just been modeled, um, what had just been uh, fixed up and, and developed because they didn't ask the women veterans what they felt safe, um, how they, you know, how they would feel safe and how they would want the, the uh, waiting room to be. So it's always good to invo involve um, the veteran in their, uh, in, in getting their perspective. So, you know, it's important to post uh, clients' rights, ensure privacy. I, I know this is sometimes so difficult. Many of us are sharing offices with multiple um, staff members, but just so crucial um, when you're working with someone. And I'm not saying doing therapy around trauma. I'm just saying giving them that space um, of privacy is, is essential. Managing noise and always uh, being uh, aware that, that the veteran may need to sit in a place where there's an easy exit um, and have choice of proceeding. And, you know, one thing, again, back to the original uh, idea that I mentioned, this whole sense of belonging or sense of separateness or sense of difference, um, and being careful in your signage that, you know, th saying things like no clients beyond this point. I think veterans, women veterans who have experienced intimate partner violence and who are homeless um, may already feel, may or may not, but in some cases may already feel a loss of sense of belonging um, and feel different and other. So really, not that you don't want to have private spaces to do your work, but do, you know, using a sign, signage in a way that is um, not as us and them oriented. So lighting, uh, decor, uh, having things in, in a way that is going to decrease stress and anxiety and feel and, and create a sense of calm, and of course, um, always being sure that we offer accessibility. Next. Use of language is, is so important, um, and it often can reflect our own personal fears and beliefs. Um, you know, we might say, well, many of us were, were trained early on to talk about folks as mentally ill versus people who are su suffering from mental illness. Um, so we really have to review the match between a strength-based perspective and our use of language. So question how certain views or statements may, you know, I'm talking to myself as well, how certain views or statements may reflect or not reflect trauma-informed care principles. You know, remain open to understanding, um, a new understanding of individuals' behavior based on how trauma may be or have impacted them. And remember that homeless veterans um, are still at risk for trauma in, in ways that perhaps um, some other populations are not. Next. So I know that we're getting short on time. I just wanted to mention 
that trauma-informed care, you can look at your own, your own work and your own self. You can look at a group together um, within your own organization. Um, you can form work groups around with multidisciplinary uh, teams. You can look at safety and how you can build trust and safety in your own work setting, assuring that work groups are supported uh, in making changes that lead to trauma-informed care practices, meaning that perhaps including some of the administrative folks in that process so that you can uh, move forward with practices and you have the power to move forward with practices that, that you may identify as important, and support change, the change process through building trust and safety within your own team in a, in a, in a very parallel way that you want to do this with veterans. Next. So um, I'm going to go to the next uh, slide, Cindy. We really, it may not always, depending on what your role is, you may not be in a role for screening or assessing a veteran for trauma. But if you are, I wanted you to have this slide and think about ways that you might include um, the veteran in the process of deciding how to be how to, how to be assessed for trauma. Or if you, in, if you're not in this type of role, being able to refer a veteran for screening and assessment around the trauma that they may have experienced. Next. There's a link that I wanted to provide you with um, for the National Center for PTSD has multiple screening tools for trauma. So again, depending on your role and depending how you're going to handle this in your own work area, you may want to visit this site. There are self-administered screens. There are interview screens. There are, there are a variety of types of screens. I'm going to show you one next on the next. Um, so there's there's one screen that is called primary care PTSD screen, and if if a veteran answers three out of these four questions, and they they are considered screening positive for a trauma, and then they are moved forward for full assessment for PTSD. Next. So where to start? Next. Um, you can start by, as we've been talking about, sort of becoming aware of your own sensibilities about how you perceive trauma, you know, what's happened in your life, what's happened in your loved one's life, sort of how you, what your perspectives are on this. Um, and then begin to be aware of the population that you're serving and the prevalence of trauma that has occurred in that population. And you can use, uh, and you can move forward with a larger system assessment by conducting an organizational assessment of your team or your program to see how aware you are uh, around trauma-informed principles. Again, not a blame or shame, but just a building process um, for becoming more trauma-informed. Think as a team about how you want to approach screening in the setting, if, if indeed you're going to screen, or how you would, re would refer for screening. Uh, utilize educational to tools on the basics related to understanding trauma. You know, the National Center for PTSD has, has great, um, a great section that is for the public. You know, maybe even sharing with some of the veterans that you're seeing that site and, the, and how they might be able to access information for themselves on that site. Start thinking about how you can enhance your environment to promote physical and emotional safety. Next. Um, review your team's usage of strengths-based approaches or even just review your own, you know, how you use language and are you, um, are you engaging in a way that you're directing all the time or are you engaging in conversation in a way where, where you're trying to enhance your understanding and asking questions about what that veteran's perspective is. Become aware of practices that might be unintentionally re-traumatizing and develop goals within your team to start one or two areas for positive change. And here's a link to the Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle, um, a little template that you could use if you wanted to start with one area of trauma-informed care and, and you have a little group that you might want to do it together and you can, you can track that and see if the change has moved in a positive direction as you hoped it would. And always involve veteran stakeholders in the process of change. Uh, support each other through the fears that come up through this process of change. Next. These are um, basic competencies for trauma-informed care, screening, awareness, understanding, engagement, 
the competency uh, around uh, understanding trauma and a commitment to trauma-informed care principles. Next. So I wanted to leave you with, with two resources. The National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans through the VA offers a fact sheet on trauma-informed care. Next. And also um, there's a lot of information about trauma and PTSD on the National Center for PTSD website. And I would encourage you um, to look at that, especially through the lens of a woman veteran and what areas might be helpful to share um, with women veterans that you work with. Thanks so much. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Nancy. Cindy, are you there? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, thank you all. Um, we will be ending the webinar shortly. Um, thank you both Karen and Nancy. I have their contact information up on the screen. Um, we didn't get time to do questions and answers because we got that late start. So what we will do is compile all the questions and answers that came through the chat function and we will send them off to either Karen or Nancy as appropriate and get answers and we'll make a little fact sheet that will be posted on the NCHB website, which is www.nchb.org, um, probably early next week. It'll take us a couple days to get all the materials up there. Um, if you have additional questions, please feel free in the next few minutes to submit them to the chat. Um, I will be sending the survey later today. Please check your email or your spam email folder um, and complete that survey. It shouldn't take you more than five minutes, maybe six or seven at the most. But it is a few questions to let us know how we did and how helpful this information was to you, but also if there's additional information you want on this specific topic on women veterans in general, on trauma-informed care, um, any of those things to please let us know in that survey as well. Um, thank you both Nancy and Karen. We really appreciate your time today. And thank you all for joining us.